morning. You are joining us today for Veteran Business Access to Federal Surplus Property, hosted by SBA's West Virginia District Office and West Virginia State Agency for Surplus Property. My name is Nikki Bomar, and I'll be your moderator. From SBA, I also have Kim Donahue and Rachel Fitzwater. The National Association for State Agencies for Surplus Property has been working with the U.S. Small Business Administration and U.S. General Service Administration to finalize program operations and requirements for veteran and businesses to participate in the Federal Surplus Personal Property Donation Program. Our presenter today is Elizabeth Cooper, who manages the West Virginia State Agency for Surplus Property. Elizabeth and her team are responsible for managing surplus property disbursement at the state level. While you may not live in West Virginia, this is a national program, so the rules are the same. And at the end, we will provide you with a link to find your state contacts. A few quick disclaimers today. If you are a member of the press, information provided today is an educational overview on the program and not for attribution. Reporters can contact me directly to schedule an interview. Information provided during the training is not intended to be legal or accounting advice. And if we could go to the next slide, please. If you have a very specific question or think of something following the training, you can email us at wvinfo at sba.gov. Now I will go ahead and turn it over to our presenter. Good morning, everyone. OK, I'm going to jump right in and uh, start talking a little bit about West Virginia. As she said, this program is available throughout the country. Um, most states probably handle things in the same way, but they're um, there might be a few differences. So like I said, today I'm speaking specifically about West Virginia, but if there is anything that um, is different uh, in other states that I'm aware of, you know, I'll let you know. So the Federal Property and Administrative Administrative Services Act of 1949. This is what authorizes state agencies such as the West Virginia SAS to coordinate the donation of um, property retired by the federal government. Now, a SIASP is a state agency for surplus property. Every state has one and every U.S. territory has one. And I know she mentioned that there will be a link at the end. Um, to where everybody can look up to see who you need to contact in your particular state. You can also get more information about the surplus property program by going to NASASP, which is the National Association for State Agencies for Surplus Property. And our website is nasasp.org. Um, and you can go on there and see how the program works and who you need to contact in each state. That information's on that site also. Next slide. Um, there we go. Okay, the um, act was signed in, the Veteran Small Business Act of 2018 was signed into law on January the 3rd, 2019. Now, it did take a little bit longer than that for us to get everything going because we have to partner with the um, SBA, we have to partner with the General Services Administration, and so we had to develop an agreement between all of us and you know you have to have attorneys review that and all that stuff so it did take a little bit longer for us to get the program up and going now our first piece of property was acquired by a veteran in september of 2021 and we actually have what we call the overseas program and that is where we get to see the property that's available overseas and it just so happened that we got a really nice heavy duty forklift in here and we had a veteran jump right on it and we are always constantly all the sasp around the country we're always looking at what's available overseas to try to get that stuff in here available to our donees now keep in mind that like i said different sasp operate different differently but when it comes to the overseas program, um, there is fees you have to pay to get stuff shipped back, things of that nature. So in addition to the normal fees that you may have to pay when it comes to shipping and things like that, you'll also have to pay that. But I will tell you that this particular veteran had a piece of equipment like we were able to acquire for him. He was able to sell that piece of equipment and then take the money that he, the profit he had from selling it and pay the shipping and the fees to us. And then now he has 
this forklift that will be his after 18 months. Now, it, there is a compliance period in which title stays with the federal government, so you don't own it during that time, but you do get to use it during that time. And I will go into compliance a little bit more here later on in the presentation. Next slide. Now, as far as who is eligible for the program, um, you have to be a registered VOSB and you can go to, if you look down there at the bottom, it says uh, vetbiz.va.gov. That's where you're going to go to get registered for the program. Now, when it comes to West Virginia, you have to live in West Virginia to get property through our state. Now, if you have a state that's not participating or they haven't signed the MOA that allows the SAS to, to participate in this program, um, you, you can talk to the SASP in your state and then if they're not participating, they may be able to tell you how you can get in contact with another state because there is ways that states can work together and allow uh, donees from one state to get it through another state, but you have to talk to your state in particular. But when it comes to West Virginia, since we did sign the MOA, you have to go through West Virginia if you live in West Virginia and you cannot be a resident of another state to go through our state or your business rather cannot be located in another state in order to go through the West Virginia SASP. Um, as it says at the bottom, state agencies don't have any control over the certification process. All we can do is guide you to the website and let you know who you need to talk to, but it can take weeks to get registered for the program and you have to be registered and approved as a VOSB before you can apply to participate in the, in the Federal Surplus Property Program. Next slide. Okay, as far as veteran status and who is eligible, a veteran is a person who served on active duty and was discharged or released um, under any condition other than dishonorable. You can be a reservist or a member of the National Guard um, called to federal active duty or disabled from a disease or injury while you were in the line of duty or in training status. And you can also be a service disab disabled veteran who's a veteran who possesses a disability rating letter issued by the VA, establishing a service connected rating between zero and 100 or a disability determination from the Department of Defense. And whether you're disabled or, um, or just a regular VOSB, it doesn't matter. Everybody is treated the same in the program. Next slide, please. Ownership, you have to own at least 51% of the, the business. And the, as far as control, the veteran owner must have full control over the day-to-day -day management of the business. Next slide, please. Okay, as far as what is available through GSA Access, you know, you can get a little bit of anything out there, to be honest. You'd be quite surprised. Once you get access to the site, they have a little bit of everything. But the key is, what would be available to you? Well, it depends on what your business is. What type of business are you running? Um, say, for example, um, you know, I don't know. Say you have a daycare or something like that, then we're not going to get you a plane. It has to be something that goes in line with your business. Now, what we see a lot of here in West Virginia is farms. So any farming equipment or anything like that would be available to a farm. However, there, there probably would be no need for a farm to have a boat. If there is a need for a boat, then they would have to justify why it is they're asking for a particular item. Now, what we do here in West Virginia is if you see an item that you want, you will send us the item control number and I will tell you, I'll show you here where to get all that here in a little bit. But what you're going to do is you're going to email us and you're going to have that item control number and then you're going to tell us, OK, this is the purpose. This is what I'm going to do with this piece of equipment. And then we will look at that and make sure, OK, this is in line with their business plan. So we will go ahead and request the property 
on behalf of the business. Now keep in mind though, just because you request a piece of property does not mean that you're going to get it. GSA is the one that actually determines which state gets which piece of property and they have a formula that they use to make it fair so that everybody every state gets their fair share of items and then once the items are donated they're considered donated from the federal government because they are donating it to the SASP and then what we do is we have to turn around and we charge a fee to get the items to you. Now, the fee can vary in every state. Every state has a state plan of operation, and you have to actually see the state plan of operation in your state to see what they're allowed to charge and how the, uh, things operate with them. For example, say like compliance. We have to do compliance checks, and compliance checks are where we just make sure that you are using the property that has been has been given to you but we have to charge because most states don't get an appropriation to run their program therefore gsa requires that we charge enough to cover our overhead we don't have a profit or anything like that we're just supposed to charge enough to break even so the more people that we get involved in the program then it would make sense that we would have to charge lower fees but during the compliance period like i said you do not own the property but after the compliance period, the property is yours and you can sell it or do whatever you need to do with it. But during the compliance period, you can only use it for the purpose of your business and you cannot have any personal use of the item. Next slide, please. So um, here is a picture of the forklift that I was talking about, and we were actually able to uh, get two of those. Now, both of them did not go to veterans. Um, to let you know, when a SASP allocates property, you know, I was talking about how the federal government does it and how they have a formula to try to be fair to make sure everybody's getting their fair share. The same thing is going to happen with the SASP. So if we have more than one donee that wants a particular piece of property then we have a formula and some different things that we have to follow to determine how we're going to allocate it now for this particular piece of property we only had one donee that asked for it so he was able to get it with no issue and we will look at things like you know were you the first to ask for it um have you had property in the past how many pieces of property do you have those are the things that we look at when we try to determine which donee to allocate property to. Now, just so you know, for this particular program, the donation program isn't just for veterans. It's also for other tax supported supported entities. And in some cases, it can be for nonprofits. Now, when it comes to a veteran owned nonprofit, a veteran has to be registered with the VA. So the VA is going to look at your business to see whether or not you qualify. As a nonprofit, you may not be able to qualify through the veterans program. However, you may have a nonprofit that would qualify in another means. Now, this is all about veterans today, so that's where I'm going to keep my focus. However, if you do have a nonprofit, you can go to our website, which is wvsurplus.gov. On the left hand side, there's a veterans link you can click on that'll tell you all you need to know about veterans. But if you're a nonprofit, you can click on our other application for eligibility. And as long as you can fall into one of the categories listed on our regular application, you may possibly, possibly qualify for the program as a nonprofit if you have a 501c and you can, like I said, fall in to any of those other categories. So if you are a nonprofit, you're more than welcome to give us a call and we will walk you through getting qualified as a nonprofit if it's even possible. Next slide, please. Okay, these are uh, these are some pictures of some of the other property that has been acquired in West Virginia. Now these haven't all went to veterans, 
but um, if you look up there, like on the upper right hand, that that picture is for our division of highways. There are a lot of snow plows on the roads in West Virginia that were obtained through the federal property program. On the left hand side, that's a lot of generators at one time. Our Office of Emergency Management, they had the generators available so that in the case of a power outage, we might be able to supply power to, say, a nursing home or to a pump station to keep water on for everybody. And of course, you can see the boat there at the bottom. Now, when it comes to items like these, most items, you're going to have a 12 month compliance period. And what that means is that during the first 12 months after you place the item into service, the title will remain with the federal government. Now, so say for example, in the case of the generators, as long as there's an original acquisition cost of less than $5,000, then your compliance period is only going to be 12 months. However, if you look over there, on the right hand side, you're looking at something that definitely costs more than um, than $5,000. So in cases like that, you're going to have an 18 month compliance period. And there are some items that have even a longer compliance period, like say, for example, airplanes. So when you have an item that has a, com a compliance period of more than 12 months, we will let you know. We will make sure that you understand that. We will claim, uh, stamp your distribution document, which is what we call it a federal invoice, okay? Um, you will be able to see right on there. It'll say compliance. If there's something that is longer than an 18 month compliance period, you'll, you know, there's papers you have to sign and we will make sure that you are aware of your compliance period because it's very important that you understand that title does remain with the federal government during the compliance period. Because what will happen is say, for example, um, you know, you sell something in the 17th month when you had an 18 month compliance period, what you're actually doing is trying to sell something that you don't have title to. Therefore, you could find yourself in a little bit of trouble. But just to let you know, the SASP are really, really good at working with you. And what we'll do, and this isn't just West Virginia, this is all around the country. When you have an item that is under compliance, we make sure that you know, and then we'll send you a letter at the end of your compliance period, at least in West Virginia, that's how we do it. We send a letter and we say, okay, your compliance period is now over, you satisfied it. So you can keep right on using that item in your business and we hope you get years of use out of it. But say the needs of your business change after the 18 month, months and you would need to sell it or something like that, you would be able to do it without any negative consequences because you would actually have title to the property. Next slide, please. Can you guys still hear me? Ah, oh, there we go. Um, now, there's a couple of different ways that you can get property. You can actually, when you register with us or any SASP, you can let us know what you're looking for and we will screen those items for you. There's actually what we call a want list. And in West Virginia, we have a sheet that's attached to our application where you tell us exactly what it is you want. And actually, you can do that with any SAS because there's also a means for us to go into GSA Excess, which is where you're going to find most of your property. We can go in there and set up want lists and then we'll be notified. Say, for example, you want a, a dump truck, just like you see there. We can put that on a want list and then when a dump truck becomes available, we can let you know, hey, this dump truck is available and this is what we think it's going to cost um, to get this to you, depending on where it's located and whether or not there's shipping or anything like that involved. Now, some SASPs do just direct donation or direct pickup. And um, by direct pickup, what I mean by that is, say, for example, you would get this dump truck here and it's located in Virginia. Well, we can 
take care of all the paperwork. You can pay your fees, sign everything, and then we'll send you a letter of authorization, you and whoever the holding agency is, and we will say, okay, we are authorizing this particular donee to pick this item up directly from you. So we can do direct pickups like that, or we may possibly be able to arrange shipping, something like that for you. Now, I can tell you in West Virginia, we do have a tractor trailer, we have a flatbed, we can go and pick certain items up. We just have to um, take care of all that ahead of time. We have to see, okay, what are you willing to pay? Can you afford the shipping? If I send my guys, you know, I've got to cover their any fee or excuse me, any expenses that they may have. All of that is taken into consideration. Now, as far as what we actually um, would charge, that is all a percentage of the original acquisition cost. And I'm going to show you here in just a minute where you can see that. Now, you do have to be registered with a SASP in order to get login information for GSA access. Now you can see right on the right hand side of the screen there, that would be your login button. And then once you click that, you enter the information. Now the way we do it here in West Virginia is you fill out your application. And then once you are approved, we will send you an email with your login information. Next slide, please. Here is, th this is just a screen that shows your ID and your password and how you enter it. And after you do that, you just click login. Next slide, please. And once you get into GSA Access, there are a number of ways that you can screen for property. If you go over to the right hand side there, you see your advanced search. You can click on that and you can look at the types of items that are available. Like, of course, you can look right here and see your boats and your clothing and all that stuff. But you can go into more detail. You can screen by state. Say um, you are a business in West Virginia and you know that you don't want to drive out of West Virginia to pick something up. Or you might just want to look at the surrounding states then you can go ahead and screen. If you know you only want Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, you can screen and look at just those four states, or like I said, you can do it by the item type, whatever you're needing, however you want to do it. Next slide, please. Okay, now this is, this has a lot of important information on here. Um, the item control number that I was telling you about, you see it right there at the top. Anytime that you talk to us about any piece of property, um, we really need the item control number because oftentimes you might see, you know, five boats out there that look exactly like this one. And we want to make sure that we are talking about the correct piece of property. That's why we like the item control number on all emails and correspondence. Now you look up there at the top and you see it says add to cart. When you get your login and password, you won't be able to add anything to cart. That has to be done through the SASP. So you're not going to be able to hurt anything by getting out there and looking. So when you get your login, get out there and look and see what's out there because like I said, you're going to be really surprised at all the wonderful things that you're going to see. Now, if you look over to the right here, it says screening ends April 21st. Of course, this is an older slide, it's 2021. But in order to request something, you need to request it prior to the screening ending. Because once the screening ends, everybody else that has already put their request in, that they're going to be considered. You're not going to be considered if you don't get it in before then. And then it's important too, because with GSA Access, if something doesn't get donated through the donation program, then it goes on to another level to possibly sales or, you know, fixed price sales or, or something else. It wouldn't be available after this date because it moves on to the next phase within the program. Now, with your item description, 
pay close attention to the item description before you request something. It's going to tell you anything that you need to know about the item. OK, is does something need to be repaired? Um, how many hours say on an engine, the size, the weight, anything like that you're going to find within the item description. And we will look at that when if you request something through the West Virginia SAS, we're going to look at that and we're also going to look if you come down the page a little bit more, it says condition. We're going to make sure that you're requesting something that is usable, repairable, in, in good shape. Some things are even new out there, but we don't want something that says, you know, scrap. Because if it says scrap, then that means it can't be repaired. And if or chances are it cannot be repaired. So we don't want you to request something that you're not going to be able to repair because you're not going to be able to meet that requirement of having the item in service within 12 months. And what exactly does it mean to have something in service? Well, say for example, um, if it's a lawnmower, you get a lawnmower this time of year, it's in service if it's out cutting grass, right? But say you have a lawn, um, a company where you cut grass, a lawn cutting company, or you are, um, I don't know, cutting trees or anything like that. But but say you have, say you have a lawnmower, a riding lawnmower that you want to use in your business, and you require it in December in West Virginia. Well, we can't cut grass, so there's no need to cut grass anyway until at least April in West Virginia. But so long as you can go uh, out and you can fire that mower up and you'll be able to cut grass when the grass needs to be cut, even if it's in January, you can still consider it to be in service if it is ready and available for use. It's not your fault that there's no grass to be cut in January, February, and March. But if it is ready and available for that first cut in April, then you are still in good shape and your item is considered to be in service. So other things to look at on this screen, the original unit acquisition cost or the total acquisition cost. In this case, it's going to be the same thing unless there's, you know, m multiple units. But what you're looking at is your total acquisition cost. That's going to tell you a couple of things. One thing it's going to tell you is, oh, OK, this cost more than $5,000. So we know that there is going to be an extended compliance period that goes out beyond the 12 months. The other thing that that number is going to tell you, or at least it's going to give you an idea of what you might be charged for that. Now, in West Virginia, we our fee scale is, is very flexible. Our state plan says that we can charge up to 55 percent. As a general rule, now this isn't always the case because if it's a bigger item, we may charge much less. But to give you an idea as a general rule, we typically charge 10% of the original acquisition cost. So in West Virginia, if you got this boat, then you would be paying $702.50, and that is the administrative fee. And what that's for is, like I said, that covers all of our overhead for the federal program. But just to let you know what we have to do, you know, we're screening the property for you. We may be arranging um, pickup or helping get, getting it shipped to you, anything like that. We're going to send you a distribution document after the item is allocated to you, which is your invoice. It will say on there whether or not it's compliance. And it, well, it'll say compliance if it is compliance. If it isn't stamp compliance, then you know it's just normal 12 months. But what we also do is shortly after you receive the item, we will do a compliance check. Now, most of our compliance checks are just done through email. And we send you a sheet and you print it out and it says, OK, I put this item in service on this date and I'm storing this item at this particular location. Now, if you did do not have the item in service by the time you get the first compliance check, it's no big deal. You have 12 months. You just simply say, tell us, you know, this item is being repaired. I'm working on it. I estimate I'll have it in service by this day. And what we'll do is we will follow up to make sure that you get the item in service. Now, if something happens, um, and we have run into this lately, even with, say, 
for example, the highways trucks. Because of all the shipping issues and the trouble that everybody's having getting parts for their vehicles or parts for anything at, at now, but you you can send us an email and you can say, hey, you know, I've got this ordered, but this part is on back order. It's not going to be here for another three months, but I know that I'm supposed to have this in service by next month. You can send us an email, explain to us what's going on and request a couple more months to get it in service. And if you have a valid reason, we will work with you and we can talk to GSA and we can extend that 12 months if there is an issue with getting the item in service, but simply because you didn't do it, that's not a good reason. However, if you can give us a good reason, such as not being able to get the parts, then we can possibly allow you an extra two, three months, whatever you need to get the item in service. Next slide, please. Okay, now I've already went over a lot of this with you, but when requesting the item, please, please include the item control number. And then once you write that down too, it's a lot easier to find the item in GSA Access. You type that in and you're gonna come straight to the item and you don't have to do all that searching. Be aware that all requests are not guaranteed. We will do everything that we can to get an item for you. However, like I said, GSA, is the one that determines which state gets which piece of equipment. However, when you send us your request, if there is something, if there's a reason that you feel that you should get this piece of property, um, I don't know, say you need it to keep your business up and going or anything like that, you can add that in the email to tell us or say there, um, I don't know, say there was a, a flood in your area and say you help with things like that or you know you, you need a boat or something you might be able to put it in an email for us to pass it on to GSA and say hey we have a special request for this it never hurts to ask and it never hurts to include the information please don't think it's a guarantee though because it's not but if there's a particular reason that you think you should be you should receive this item there's some sort of emergency or something let us know and we can always pass that on and it may possibly help in getting that property to you but understand first gsa has to allocate it to the sasp before we can even allocate it on so if you we would have two or three donees wanting the same piece of equipment then we have to look to see okay how are we going to allocate this and like as i said before there's just a number of things that we have to look at to determine which donee is going to receive the property. And we are required to charge a service fee, as I mentioned earlier, but it's just to break even. We're not in this to make any money. We're just trying to get the items to you and trying to pay our overhead. Next slide, please. Federal property compliance, I've touched on this a little bit. You can only request items that can be used for your business. That's why we want to know in the email when you send it to us what you need the piece of property for. No personal use is permitted during the compliance period. It belongs to the federal government and you are requesting this on behalf of your business. So no, it's not okay if um, you have a farm. It's not okay to use it on your farm and then loan it out to your brother-in-law to do stuff around his house or anything like that. It can only be used for your business. You have to be able to place the item in service within 12 months of the acquisition date. Like I said, if you need longer than that, you can email us. We may be able to work with you. Title stays with the government for 12 months. Uh, we've already talked about that in the longer compliance period when there is an acquisition cost of $5,000 or more. Unauthorized sale, disposal, cannibalization, or destruction is prohibited. Now, if you do get the property and say something happens and it's broken, you can't repair it, you can let us know you can send us an email and we can work with you to get that property back or do whatever we need to do now keep in mind though during the compliance period 
if anything has to come back to us, you will be responsible for the shipping or anything to get it back to us. Now, as far as cannibalization goes, that is prohibited unless, once again, you have a piece of property and it, it is unserviceable. There's absolutely nothing that can be done to prepare, uh, to repair it. Then we may possibly be able to look at cannibalization, but all of that stuff has to be requested. Anything you're seeing there, the disposal, cannibalization, destruction, any you can't do anything during that compliance period without talking to us. And absolutely, you cannot sell it until your compliance period is over. And when it's talking about the verification of use, that is the email that I was talking about where we send you a form to fill out. We may even do an in-person compliance visit. It all just depends on the location of the property, what we have going on, and how many compliance um, items we have at one time. So instead of sending you something over the uh, in the email, we may call you and say, hey, we might run by and you know check on this piece of property. That's why it's real important that you tell us the actual physical location of the property when we send you the compliance report. Next slide. Okay, now here's some links and I'm not done. I have more questions and stuff here that have been, or excuse me, I've had some questions that have been sent to us and I do want to answer those questions, but I do want to make sure that you guys are aware of the links that may possibly help you out. Um, like I said, if you come down to the very bottom one there, the wbsurplus.gov, you are more than welcome to come to our site, click on veterans, and it will give you an overview of the veterans program. As far as the states operating differently, there may be different fees, things like that. However, the qualification that you have to do with the VA, that's going to be standard with anybody. So be sure that you get that taken care of before you try to apply for the surplus property program within your state. Now with us, we have two different applications on our website. We have one specific to veterans, and then we have another one that is for different entities, which like I explained to you all, if you're a nonprofit out there, you don't be discouraged that you wouldn't qualify as a veteran owned small business. You still may be able to qualify as a nonprofit. Now, it's real important on the applications that you sign every place that it tells you that you need to sign. And it does have to be, of course, the CEO of the business, the chief executive officer. Something else that we are required to get when we take your application, we have to have financial information. And this is actually for any donee. We're not trying to get in your business and see how you know, if you've got some huge profit or anything like that, that's not the point of it. The point is that GSA does not want us to allocate any property to anybody if you don't have the means to keep the property up during the compliance period. So when we ask you for financial information, it doesn't have to be anything real detailed. Um, you can submit a balance sheet. You might be able to submit, say, a profit and loss statement. Um, anything like that to where we can just look and get an idea of, you know, whether or not your business would be able to maintain the property during the compliance period. Now, I'm going to go through some questions that have been sent to us ahead of the webinar, and so hopefully I'll be able to answer all of these today. And like was said earlier in the presentation, if you think of questions afterwards, you can always send them to the SBA or you can send them to me directly um, that I have no issues with that. So let's get started here on the questions. Um, it mentions getting useful tools like a roadmap or, uh, or how to process and how to what benefits are involved with the program. We're working on that here in West Virginia. I mean, we, we are constantly trying to update our website. We are working on brochures, things like that. And I think that most of the SASP are doing the same thing. We are trying to get the information out there. 
I will tell you that NASAS does have a meeting every year and we are meeting in July this year. And the veterans program is one of the things that we will definitely be talking about a lot. So you may see, even if you're not seeing a lot of stuff out there right now, after July, you may see even more. But I do know that the SASP are trying to get some information out there to everybody. We're trying to pull all that together. Now, where do you begin? You're going to begin at that vet, on that vet, vet biz site. That's where you're going to go and get registered and any questions you have should be answered for you there. There are no additional perks for women. Um, all the veterans are treated the same. And as far as where businesses might make mistakes, uh, truthfully, we've only gotten prof or excuse me, property for a few of our veterans and we've not had any issues. But I would say that the biggest way you could make a mistake is if you use something personal you definitely definitely do not want to do that and remember that you do not have title to the item until after the compliance period that would probably be one of the biggest issues because um, like i said if you would try to sell it or do something with it during the compliance period it's not yours you are selling a piece of property that still belongs to the federal government but I can tell you that our donees in general in the state of West Virginia, we don't run into any issues because we educate everybody and we work with you very, very closely to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing because we don't want there to be any issues. And we are always here to answer your questions. And I tell everybody at the state level or even with the federal program, because we have a state program here as well as the federal, I have some of the nicest people ever working for me, and we will be more than glad to help you at any time. Okay, next question, um, is the property available to buy, lease, or is it free? Well, it is considered to be free because it is donated. However, you do have to pay the administrative fee. As far as buying federal property, when um, the items, do are not allocated through the donation program and they're not bought as a fixed price sale. There's a different a, a number of ways that the federal government can dispose of property. But if it doesn't go through these programs, then sometimes the items are available out there for sale. That's actually GSA sales and there's information about that on the website. But that is not the same as this program because you'll be paying fair market value or however GSA prices the items. If you buy it, then that's what you're going to be paying. But through the donation program, it is free other than the fee that you have to pay us and then any shipping costs that may be associated that you have to pay. Now, are there restrictions to the service? Um, it's only the compliance period. Well, a couple of things. I mean, you have to make sure that whatever you request is in line with your business, that's one thing. As I said, no personal use. And the other thing is the compliance period. So yes, if you do know somebody that had something that they couldn't sell for a while because it belonged to the government, it's that compliance period that I'm talking about. And of course, always the goal with this is to get something to use in your business. As a matter of fact, you're not, you shouldn't even request something in the hopes, okay, I can use it personally in 12 months. That's not the point of the program. The point of the program is that you're getting it for your business. And then after the compliance period, if you no longer need it in your business, then you can do whatever you need to do with it. As far as where to find items, like it was the GSA excess site that I showed you earlier, that's going to be the best place for you to get out there and look, now we may possibly have something here in our warehouse that you could utilize too. A lot of SASP do have federal warehouses. Now I can tell you right now, we're just now building ours up. So we don't have a lot here on site. However, you know, we do have some office stuff if you would need to get your office up and going. Say for example, like file cabinets, something like that. Then you could come here and get a file cabinet from us for, you know, four or $5 is all it would cost you. But as of right now, that's we don't have a lot in our warehouse, but just to let you know, we are trying to get more 
but a lot of states do have federal warehouses that have a lot of items in it. So you can always contact your SAS to see what's available in their warehouse if they have a warehouse. Now, as far as the kinds of equipment, like I said, it's a little bit of anything. I mean, there's medical stuff out there if um, you have some sort of medical business. Um, there are a lot of farming equipment, dump trucks, things like that. Anything that you can imagine that the federal government could use, be it in an office or out in the field, when they no longer need it, it could be available to you through this program. Um, I touched on nonprofits. Like I said, you may not be able to get registered through VetBiz, but you still may be eligible for the program. So by all means, give us a call if you want to know what you, whether or not you may qualify, or like I said, look at the application. If you don't fall into one of those business types on the application, then you're not going to qualify. But you may look at those business types and wonder, am I that? Do I qualify? I'm not sure. Give us a call and we'll tell you exactly how you can fall into those different categories. Okay. I'm just reading questions as I go here. I don't want to keep repeating the same questions. Um, here's another one about how to get certified. That's going to come back to the VetBiz site where you can go and it'll tell you everything you need to do. There's even a pre-qualification quiz and you see the links right there where you can take a quiz to even see if you could possibly qualify. Now, I've got a question here about shipping prices. You know, that's just going to depend. It's going to depend on which SASP you go through. Uh, for example, like I said, we do have the option of going and picking property up because we do have a flatbed and we do have a tractor trailer. So if you go through us and it's something to where I can send my guys then it may not be as much as what it's going to cost if we go through a shipping company. Shipping companies, it all, it just varies. It depends on the state. Um, in West Virginia, we have to be very careful um, when we bid things. We have to bid everything out here. There are certain bid limits, and so we have to look at contracts if it goes above a certain dollar amount. So as far as shipping costs, it's really going to vary just depending on the rules and regulations in the state and which shipping company that they use. In West Virginia, for example, we're supposed to use anybody that, you know, lowest price that meets all the specs, lowest bid meeting specs is how we would do it here in West Virginia. However, if it's a smaller shipment to where it's not going to go above bid limits, then um, it may not be an issue at all. And it Bidding is a little bit complicated in West Virginia, and you guys aren't on here to hear that. But if it's less than like $2,500 for shipping, then we could probably take care of it pretty quickly without having to get bids or anything like that. Okay, how to apply? Like I said, the first thing is the vet biz. Second thing is to go to the SAS website in your state, click on the application, and fill it out and get it to us. As far as the items that are available or when they are available, once you are approved through the surplus property program, a lot of the times I can approve the applications within the same day. Sometimes it might take a day or two depending on what's going on, but you'll hear back from us. If you don't hear back with us within a week, give us a call, but you should hear from us within just a day or two. But like I said, if within a week, if you don't hear from us, then give us a call or shoot us an email so that you know we can see what's going on and make sure nothing has slipped through the cracks. But once you are registered with us and we have approved your application, then you can start getting property very, very quickly. Now it's talking here, uh, there's a question about first time, first serve basis. We may possibly say, for example, I have three veterans that request the same piece of property and none of you have received property from us before. In that particular case, that may be a first come, first serve basis. However, I can tell you, I do have some veterans that are right on top of everything and they immediately send me an email and a request when they see a piece of property, which is great. That's exactly what they should be doing. But if they have already received, say three or four pieces of property, and then I have another veteran 
that is requesting their first piece of property, then the one that doesn't have property may possibly get the property even if the other one requested it first. So like I said, it's, it's just there's a lot of things that we look at and we will continue to develop that process because we want to make sure that we are fair when we're getting their needs property. We want to make sure everybody gets their fair share. Now, um, I have a question here about how long can you have the property that you receive? After the compliance period is over, it's yours. So um, if you need to use that piece of property in your business for 20 years and it lasts that long, then it is yours. So long as you don't try to do anything with it prior to the end of the compliance period, there's no reason for you to ever have to give that money back, or excuse me, that property back to us or to the federal government. You follow all the rules, follow the compliance, don't use it personal, then you are in good shape and you can keep that property as long as you need to. If it, if you no longer need it after the compliance period, dispose of it as you need to. If it's prior to the end of the compliance period, then you need to contact us and then we do need to get that property back. That's something that we hardly ever see though. People know what they need, they know what they want, they get it and they utilize it properly properly, excuse me, and then you don't have to worry about getting it back to us. Now, as far as the process, is the process different in every state? I think I've went over that pretty well. Um, the overall program is the very same. It's just, you know, like I said, some, some states have warehouses, some don't, some charge different fees than others. May, maybe they've got more donees so they can charge a little bit less. Um, it, it all just depends. But the compliance, when I talk about the 12 months in service and then the 12 month compliance or 18 months, if it's more than $5,000, all of that, that is all the same in every state. So you're not going to be able to get something in one state and only have to use it six months because the uh, 12 month compliance, that is actually set with GSA. Now, when it comes to longer compliance with certain items in states, that may be possible. It all just depends on the SASP and the circumstances of the item. So you would have to talk to the SASP in your state to get specifics. Now, the way we work here is if you request a piece of property from us, you can ask us then, hey, what will you charge us for this? And we'll go ahead and let you know up front. That way you know whether or not you can afford it, whether or not you even want to do it. And I would say that would be the same with any SAS. You could always talk to them and see what they're going to charge just to make sure that, that you even want to pay that much for it. And understand too, if you would request a piece of property and for some reason you change your mind or you realize you can't afford it or you're not going to be able to put it in service, it's okay. There's not going to be any issues with that. You just need to let us know, hey, I don't want that. And you're only going to have a couple of weeks to pick these items up. If, if, you, are, if you are doing direct pickup, you're only going to have a couple of weeks. So that's very important too. And if you're going to go out, say you can't get there to get the property for a month, you need to let us know that so that we can request that the holding agency hold on to that property a little bit longer. But understand they, they are not obligated to do so. So that's also one of the things that we will consider when we're trying to figure out how to allocate a piece of property. It'll be OK, this person can't get out there for a month. But this person can get there in a week and it's really supposed to be removed quicker than a month. So they may get that piece of property. Uh, let me see. Can property be used for nonprofit startup? Well, that's going to be like what I was talking about before. Um, no, if you're trying to start up a nonprofit, I don't think that you're going to be, you're not going to be able to get in there and get qualified through the VA. But another thing is if you're just starting up, you may not even have any financial information for us to look at. Now that does not mean that new businesses can't request property. I don't mean that, but you do have to be established or at least show us something so that we can look and see that you will be able to take care of the property, get in service, things of that nature. But like I said, nonprofits still give me a call if you um, don't qualify through the VA and you want to try to go through one of the other entities or, you know, call yourself. Say, for example, 
um, nonprofit health, nonprofit education, provider of assistance to the homeless and the needy. Those are some of the other areas where you may qualify, even if you don't qualify through the VOSB portion. Next slide, please. Was that the last one? I th I'm sorry, I thought I had, oh, there it is. I thought I had one with my contact information. Um, Doug Elkins, he is the federal property manager for the state of West Virginia. So when you want a piece of property, you would need to send the request to him. However, know that you can always copy me or Matt Harper on it, just in case for some reason, you know, Doug is out. We always try to put auto replies on there to let you know that we are not, you know, we're not here. But just in case, you can always CC on us because we don't want to miss a deadline. As I showed you there on GSA Access, once the screening ends, you can't request it after that. We also have another person, I don't have his contact information on here, but we recently hired somebody to help Doug. So uh, his name is Bill. So if you guys would get a call from Bill, then he is also working with Doug. Um, Matt Harper, he takes care of, he's mainly on our state side. However, if Doug's out of the office or I'm out of the office, then Matt, Matt can't answer any questions you have. And of course, you see my contact information there at the bottom. Um, I thank you all so much for listening to me today, and I hope that you got a lot out of it. And um, I hope to be working with you guys really soon. Thanks, so Elizabeth. I don't we actually had some questions in the chat. Will you be able to take a few of those? Yeah, absolutely. I can't see anything, so I don't, or if I can, I don't know how. That's okay. Um, I can to you. Okay, go ahead. I'm just going to give a few quick uh, answers to go through a few of these. Um, the meeting is recorded. We'll have to send you the link following the meeting because it doesn't complete until we end this. So Kim has an email address list of those who registered so she can send it out to them. Um, the slides have been posted in the chat. You'll just need to uh, go through the Q&A chat. Uh, Rachel posted those. All right, so what is the difference between federal access property and surplus property? For, for this program, you guys are only eligible for um, the surplus donation program, okay? Like I said, there's a lot of different ways for pr uh, property to be disposed of, but for you all, you just get, it has to be donation property before any VOSB can get property. What it is, like I said, there's different ways at different levels that the property is disposed of and different types of donees are eligible for different things. Um, but for this, it's only surplus donation. That's all you're eligible for. Next question, please. The GSAX site uh, shows that animals are available. What kind of animals are they? Livestock or pets? Uh, I've never had an animal come through here, to be honest, but there are, we do have somebody, his name, I believe Bob Kicksock is the person that takes care of the animals. So as far as what is available out there, I, to be honest, I don't know. I would have to look. I don't know if they would have livestock out there. It's possible. What would happen when it comes to an animal, if you're interested in something, you would need to send me an email and then I would have to talk to Bob to see and it's that way with some things with GSA and certain items that you want um, when you send us the email if we're not sure we may have to check with GSA and when it comes to animals that would be something that I would have to talk to them about because that's just not something I've ever had a donee eligible for in this state I've never had it requested okay, great thank you Mm -hmm. um, for someone who is import-export business, can we sell used properties obtained through the federal surplus property overseas? You cannot sell anything until, what you would have to do is when you get the property, you would have to use it for the compliance period. After that, you would be able to sell it. But to acquire something to just turn right around and sell it, no, you would not be able to do that. Um, you would have to, even property that comes from overseas, it's the very same rules and regulations as anything you would get within the, in the states, um, in the continental US. You would have to still use it during your compliance period before you can sell it. 
OK, and what happens if someone fails to put something to use within the compliance period? Well, if, first of all, we're going to work with you so that that doesn't happen. But if something would happen, you're not going to be any, in any major trouble or anything like that. You're just going to have to get the item back to us if you cannot get it in into service and it would be at your expense. But that's it. Okay. Um, do you get charged a fee for every request, even if you don't get the item? No, no, you only you only pay if you receive the item. If you request 100 items and you only get one, you only pay the fee for the one item and we're requesting. We don't we don't charge anybody for that. Do we have surplus.gov for every state? There should be. I know every state has a website, but I'm not sure that they're all the same as far as the .gov. However, you can go to the NASASP, N-A-S-A-S-P, which is short for National Association for State Agency for Surplus Property, um, .org, and then when you go to that site, it'll give you an email address for everybody. Do we and have even a website? I'm sorry. I, I, I know he was asking website. I think it gives websites too, but if not, it gives the emails for the directors and then you can email them for the website. Sorry about that. That's OK. And um, do we have a full do we do we have to have a full business plan on file with the SASP? What about startups? No, all you have to have with us, um, you need to send in your letter saying that you are a registered BOSB. Um, you need to send in the application and then, you know, we need to have a general idea of what your business is just so that, like I said, we have to look at your business type when we look at the property you request. And then we do need some sort of financial information. So I know as a startup, you're not going to have a whole, whole lot available, but you may be able to at least provide us with a balance sheet. And just so you know, I mean, in my state, I'm I'm an accountant, so I can look at something and I can get a pretty good idea when I look at it of, you know, what's going on. Now, other states, I don't know what the criteria is that they look at. Um, they may look at something a little bit different than we do, but what we are told from GSA is we just need to make sure that you can maintain the property that you receive. So look at it this way, too. If you're getting a piece of property, say it's not as expensive or it's not going to be, for example, file cabinets, OK? Um, file cabinets, you're not going to have to have a bunch of money out there to maintain a file cabinet. If you can pay me $5 for the file cabinet, it's yours. So it just depends on the business and we just need to see that, you know, you do have enough to at least get up and get started. It's not that they're looking at the financials really, really close or harshly. And I have a concealed carry business. I'm an instructor and have a classroom set up in my house. Can I get things like a brush hog to mow the range I have set up in my back acreage? It's heavily wooded and needs to stay maintained all year round. Yes, you could actually do something like that. Um, you just need when you send us the request, just put it in the e email. This is, you know, this is a business I have. This is what I want this for. And then yes, that would be good justification. And I'm assuming they would just need to send the request, but someone's asking if you have beauty spa equipment. Uh, possibly. Um, I'm trying. We don't. I don't think that I've seen anything through here, but um, they may very well have something at the federal level. Like I said, they get stuff all the time. I can tell you that. And now this is state side, not federal side. But if you are in West Virginia that we get that stuff here a lot at our warehouse. We're located in Dunbar because of the School of Cosmetology, different places like that. They'll send the stuff down here to us. So we've had massage chairs, we've had foot massagers, just all kinds of stuff. So I know on the state side we get stuff like that. With the federal, I say just keep watching because you never know what you're going to see out there. Okay, great. And is the equipment in good working condition? It all depends. Some of it is, some of it's not. Um, that's why you just have to watch and see if it says repairable, usable, um, new. Now, when it comes to heavy equipment, you're probably not going to see anything new. However, oftentimes there is a lot of new equipment out there on GSA Access. So what you need to do is just read that description that's in there 
and then see exactly what does need to be repaired. I will tell you, when we get stuff from the overseas program, they'll do some repairs and stuff on it before it even gets over here. So like that forklift that we got for that one VSB, it was an X, both of the forklifts, as a matter of fact, were in excellent condition. We didn't have to do anything but start um, put fuel in them and start them up. Okay, great, thank you. Um, can you list the site, please, where folks can get started? Um, I'm not sure which site they're talking about. Now, ours is WV, was, this might just be the best way to tell you, WVSurplus.gov. That is um, the West Virginia site. And then on the left-hand side, if you click on Veterans, it's got all kinds of information and it'll tell you where to go. Um, vet biz is where you're going to go. I'm trying to see if I have that in front of me here. I think it's vet. That's a little bit of a longer one. Uh, vet biz got va.gov, I believe, is where you can go to actually get registered. But I know that that link, if you go to the wvsurplus.gov and click on veterans, we have that link there listed on our website. Okay, perfect. And our last question for the day, are land or buildings included in this process or only movable property? No, land and building is not. It's only personal property. It's no real property. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, so much for the great presentation today. We really appreciate you being here. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, the contact information for their office is listed on the slide. You can also always email us at wvinfo.sba.gov. We do offer a Q&A with SBA session every single Thursday at 12 p.m. So if you have questions on any of our programs or services, just go to sba.gov slash WV to get that log on information and we'd love to have you. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.